Welcome to the Funnel Reboot Podcast, brought to you by Marketing What's New. Let's get into today's show. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Today, we'll hear a former journalist tell us how we can stop sounding just like our competitors. First, I want to remind you, if you're listening to this in 2023, that Universal Analytics is going away very soon. Please make sure you upgrade to Google Analytics 4. Let's go to today's show. For several years running, noted marketing expert David Miriman Scott would access all the corporate press releases in America captured by the major wire services. These covered product launches, major client signings, and other moments where companies would talk about what distinguished them from their competitors. He posted his analysis of all this data, and without fail, almost all of them chose the same words to describe themselves. They made matters worse by, in David's words, using gobbledygook-laden phrases that are so overused to have become meaningless. We know that we've got to try to embed our brand's personality and plain English into our writing. In fact, my last episode featured an expert talking about that. But that's not all we can do. We've got to change the actual things that we say about ourselves. We've got to cut through people's cynicism. If we're ever going to be believed by our prospective buyers, we've got to own what customers say in reviews of our products or services. And we've got to make claims about ourselves that duly represent what a new buyer could experience by buying from us. Though it sounds noble, pulling this off sounds like a ton of work. But the premise of the book I'm covering today is that it's doable if you make it part of your normal marketing workflow. The book I'm talking about, which came out in 2022, is called Prove It. It's the second book by our guest, whose first book was The Content Fuel Framework. Our guest is an award-winning speaker and content creator. She has worked at various media companies, including The New York Times and Time, Inc. And in addition to that, she's also taught courses on content marketing and digital marketing at universities such as Fairleigh Dickinson, Syracuse, and the City University of New York. Let's go talk with Melanie Diesel. I'm so glad to welcome Melanie Diesel. Welcome to the show, Melanie. Thanks for having me. Uh, We are here to talk about a book that you recently came out with. Can you tell us the name of the book? Yes, the book is Prove It, Exactly How Modern Marketers Earn Trust. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the title, you know, pretty punchy, right? Prove it. Um, and maybe let's set up why marketers need to prove it. Uh, I looking around the landscape, I've got to say it's a pretty sad state of affairs out there uh, when it comes to how brands talk about themselves. Um, mm-hmm. Do you agree with me on that? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the idea for the book kind of came from that same realization is like looking around, we have a lot of brands saying things, a lot of people claiming things. Um, and at the same time, we have a consumer group an audience who has never been more skeptical in the history of marketing and sales, right? There are so many people out there to trick them. So, you know, it's sort of this perfect storm, except an imperfect storm uh, of yeah consumers who have a hard time knowing who to trust and brands who are not always backing up their claims. And so what we don't want is for people not to be aware of that and then to have that cost them sales, have it cost them customer relationships. So we're trying to shift it to a more intentional use of content and messaging that does back up your claims so that you do end up with that consumer trust. Uh, Precisely. And it's so prevalent, I think, that some people, especially those, I shudder to think, coming out of marketing programs in school, think that that's the way that we're supposed to talk. So if they look yeah. at the first line or two of every press release or of most homepages on sites, they're seeing jargon. They're seeing 
superlatives. We're the mm-hmm. biggest. We're the best. We're the most leading. All these phrases, and they've all just become cliche and hollow. Yeah, well, I think especially as a copywriter, you know, if you're working with copywriters or freelancers, um, it's easy to almost put on that, you know how we all have like a phone voice where you're like slightly more professional and buttoned up on the phone to put on that like copywriter voice where you you've got like the razzle dazzle hands and you're like, you know, there's never been a better product. Like we're the best, the the fastest, you know, you get like the old timey circus accent going on um, and you forget that like these words even if they sound nice and they rhyme or, you know, it, it kind of has like a really nice cadence, like they have meaning on their own. And when we use a word like best or simple or, you know, any of those kinds of adjectives or superlatives, like you're making a promise to your audience and you better make sure you can actually fulfill that promise because they're going to expect it, you know? So we have to, we have to be really mindful of that when we're, you know, putting out content, putting out messaging of any kind is like, where are the hidden promises in this? And are we going to be able to back that up? So well put. I think that if we stopped for a moment and asked ourselves, why are people that uh, are users of the product having YouTube videos where they unbox a product or review a software and They have no stake in it, but they are dwarving our traffic numbers by how many people check them out and Mm -hmm. hear the the influence that they give and pay credence to what they say. I I think that should tell us a lot about how they're not listening to us and that it's the things that we are saying that are driving them into the arms of these people. Um, people are always going to, you know, want to get validation, but I think we've actually gone overboard on misusing words and basically telling them not to listen to us. <laughs> well, there's there's that for sure, and it's also that a lot of the best practices that we follow, or like the the basics of marketing that were laid down, that we're we're building our businesses and our brands on top of were laid at a time when it was a very different environment. Like there were a lot fewer ads. There was a lot fewer brands competing for that attention. There were a lot fewer places for these ads and messages to be. And truthfully, they pretty much had a captive audience. You know, you look at the Mad Men days and it's like they were only reading one newspaper. So, you know, the people in that area, they didn't have all these other things. So, you know, you just needed to have one eye-catching ad and you were good to go. And we're in a very different you know, market right now. So you can't, you can't just assume that they're going to, first of all, even see what you say, but second of all, that they're going to have the time to, to process and, and do their due diligence. Like that's on us. We've got to provide the evidence and we've got to make it believable because, you know, the next best thing is just to scroll away. True. So that believable part, um, you make it clear near the beginning of the book that you think we've got to look inwardly and consider our own values Um, yes, we can have that snazzy sounding tagline, um, but we should forget about that or get to that later. We should start with figuring out what we stand for, and then we can work towards getting people familiar with, you know, short phrases and such that we have, but we have to first make sure that we're all on the same page as a business about what values we have. It's from the inside out, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes from if you're trying to do any sort of, you know, audit or critical thinking, or you're trying to examine what you have, the only way for that to be effective is if you know what the correct thing should be, right? You know what you do want people to think of you. You know what you do want them to believe. You know what impressions you don't want to give them, right? So if you have clarity on that and you're like, I know that I want my, I want them to believe that I'm competent. I want them to believe that I'm better than this specific competitor that I lose my most market share to. And I want them to know that, you know, we are truly committed to this particular uh, cause. Um, then that gives you like a good compass to know where you need to focus your attention and on not only uh, making those claims in the first place, but also backing it up with with action and with content. Mm-hmm. And this doesn't just relate to as we're trying to talk strangers into becoming customers. This follows all the way through the customer experience. And this is why policies need to come into play too, right? We need to look at those and see if they jive with the things that we're claiming before someone's bought our product. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things that can be a little overwhelming if you start to think about it. So I always encourage people to start small. But the reality is you can be using this prove it mindset in every single part of your business. So if you claim to be convenient, well, how convenient is it to get in touch with your customer service? How convenient is it to unsubscribe from your email if I want to do that? How convenient is it to do a return? Right? How, how convenient are all of those things? Because those are maybe not your product, but they're a big part of that customer experience. And so it can really go down very granular. But once you have that clarity on what you do want to be proving, you do want to be uh, trusted for, it becomes a lot more clear where you might need to make some of those adjustments. Sure. So maybe let's take a tangible example of how we would get some of those inner values to be clear and how we would back up a claim. Uh, the book does a wonderful job of breaking down the different types of, of claims that are made. Could you just give us an example or two of how yeah. people um, and brands are truly following through on what they say and giving the, the buyer a, a full idea of how they actually will make good on their promises? For sure. So one of my favorite examples right now is uh, is Patagonia. So in the book, I use them as a, as a wonderful example of a, of a brand that's showing their commitment. So they've always said uh, their mission is we're on a mission to save our home planet. Um, so if anyone's not familiar, Patagonia is like an outdoor equipment and supplies brand, right? They do hiker boots and, you know, coats and and tents and whatnot. Um, you know, they're trying to, to make people enjoy the outdoors. But you know, any brand, any company can say, like, we care about the environment. We care about sustainability. We're trying to reduce our carbon footprint. Like, it's, it stops meaning something when everyone's saying it and no one's providing further proof of the truth, right? Don't, don't just tell me that that's what you're doing. Like, show me. I want to see how are you reducing your carbon footprint? What does that commitment look like in action? And Patagonia is wonderful for this because just recently, uh, they came out and actually sort of divested ownership of the company so that all the excess profits are going into trusts that support the environment. So that could be, you know, planting trees, cleaning the ocean, et cetera. They've identified these trusts that serve the environment and then serve our home planet. Uh, and the profits are being directed there. Now, I'm not saying you need to do something of that level, like to, right. you know, di turn all your profits into, into charitable giving. But it's just a great example of that's a company who is not just saying we are committed. They are actually taking action and sharing that as proof. So we can believe them when they say we care about the home planet. Because the fact of the matter is, if they had done that and not told anybody, it was as good as not doing it at all when it comes to earning trust. So you need to be able mm -hmm. to create the content and the evidence that backs up those claims so that people can see that you're not just saying it, you are also doing it, you're living it, you're operating with those values. Right. And then... I imagine what buyers do is they will gloss over or perhaps interpolate the things that a company that embodies those values will do in the equipment and clothing that they make. So they know that the fabrics are sourced sustainably and that yep. the labor for it is done in a caring way. Sure. These are things that buyers are now going to just hand over to Patagonia. Yeah. We, we don't need an audit of that. It, it's just understood because exactly. they've taken the big steps. Yeah, exactly. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have to be, first of all, it doesn't have to be philanthropic. The, the brand that you're putting forth, it doesn't have to be a commitment to sustainability or gender equality or whatever else. It can also be like we mentioned before, like convenience. If you are telling people that you are the easiest to work with, or you are the simplest install that you integrate with the most partners, like what is that convenience claim that you're making? And how are you proving that out? How are you reassuring your audience, showing them that this is not just lip service? It wasn't just, you know, a, a, a zealous copywriter getting carried away. Like here's right. the ways that we are making sure working with us is easy. Here's the ways that we've worked to, sh to ensure that you can use this with any other software or partner you happen to work with, right? Like really show how easy it actually is. Uh, yeah. And we have to watch that it doesn't backfire. You mentioned, so back to the Patagonia one, uh, they're supporting a cause, but you if you take it too far, you're cause exploitative and you say, we need to think about, okay, let's be cause beneficial, not yes. cause exploitative. 
Yeah. And I think a, a big part of that fine line has to do with whether you're backing it up with action, right? Because if, if you are uh, leaning into a cause and it's truly something you care about and your actions and, you know, the content and communications you have show that commitment, that's wonderful. If you are making that claim and you're it, you're not truly backing it up or you're not showing the evidence, that's when the doubt starts to creep in and people wonder, like, well, are they just are they just saying this is a green product to try to sell more, or do they actually care about the environment? You know, did they did they turn their their logo rainbow for the month of Pride just to you know earn some brownie points, or do they actually have equal hiring practices and equal compensation, and do they offer you know parental leave for the non birthing parent? You know, like. Are, are they right. actually living those values or just saying it? And I think that's part of why proof is so important because as a consumer from the outside, I don't know whether it's lip service or whether you're actually living it. And that's why the proof is so important. Like, show me, let me see, let me understand, let me hear the stories of people who have experienced it so that I know that it's true. One personal example you share from the book that takes it even further into things that matter uh, is you explain that you're a mom of a child with an allergic condition. Yes. Uh, you want to tell our listeners about how seriously you take that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so my daughter is allergic to nuts. There's, there's a lot of, you know, parents who may have uh, food allergies or, or allergies yourself. Um, if you are in that boat, you may also like, I know uh, that there's very little regulation around how those things are labeled. So for me, when I'm in the grocery store, I'm looking at every package, every box, you know, is there nuts as an ingredient? Was it processed in a facility that also processes nuts? Was it used on equipment that also uses nuts. I mean, there's a lot of things to look for. But at the end of the day, I have to trust that those companies are being honest about whether it's that, right? Because it may be more inconvenient. It may mess up the design of the packaging to have to add in all those extra words. Um, and, and just that they're being truthful, that they care enough like they care about that as much as I do, um, which it's hard. I don't know that anyone cares about your own kid as much as you do, but, you know, understanding that I'm putting my trust in those brands, that they're being honest, that they're disclosing any contact with nuts um, because my child's safety depends on it. Um, now, everything we do may not be quite so, uh, you know, anaphylactic risk, uh, you know, life endangering uh, as that kind of disclosure. But same thing that you have customers who care very deeply about some of the things that you may be promising about convenience, about speed, about affordability, about how, you know, committed you are, about how good you are, at what you do, the results you're going to give them. Uh, and they need to be able to trust that, that you're doing what you say you do and, and that you are who you say you are. Um, for me, there are certain brands I know that I can't trust. Um, you know, thankfully I've, I've learned in, you know, in the forums, like there's, man, there's a forum for everything. Right. So I know True. from other parents experiences, like, Hey, this particular product says there's no contact, but my child had a reaction. So I would avoid it. Right. So I can learn from that broken trust from others. Um, but when you break the trust of your customers, like you're done. Like they're not gonna, you know, I, I think we can all name a brand that has, you know, broken our hearts and done us wrong. And we've, we've sworn off them forever, you know? Not only that, those people have an audience of their own, and thanks to social media, they will be vocal about the fact that that trust was broken. Yeah, I mean, and even if they don't have a huge audience, right, like maybe they don't have a ton of followers or, you know, a bunch of subscribers, they have family and friends, and they have people who trust their word, right? People who say, you know, if if I go to my family and I say, look, guys, you can't buy this particular brand anymore because if you if you give it to her when she's at your house, like it could cause a reaction like that has, you know, it has cascading effects. Uh, and then, you know, my my mom tells a coworker, oh, I know your granddaughter has nut allergies. Make sure you don't buy such and such crackers or whatever it is. Right. Um, so you don't even have to have a massive audience to have the ripple effects of that broken trust just create, you know, massive brand trust issues. For sure. We're going to dive into what this means for marketers uh, who deal with both the marketing communication side, but also those who are involved in digital promotion. Uh, we're going to do that right after we take a quick break. I'm taking a moment talking about how you're managing in the world of GA4. To me, the new Google Analytics is more than just an interface. Its capabilities open up our entire funnel for analytical insights and for activating our marketing data. Now, most of you have installed GA4. That's great. 
To do this takes a bit more effort than that because you must configure GA4 with Google Cloud components, takes BigQuery, Looker Studio, services that API data back and forth, etc. And that's why I'm holding GA Fast Forward in-person events to do this over two days with people. A group of us work together to implement this new stack using our own company's marketing data. We come away with ready-made dashboards and AI-built audiences that we can leverage in our Google Ads. These workshops are running in Eastern Canada and across New York State and soon in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts too. You can go now and see all the details by going to gafastforward.com, either with the number four in Fast Forward or all spelled out. Let's get back to the show. Okay, thanks again, uh, Melanie. We were just talking about the way this, that marketers can can look at this, and I think it can be a little overwhelming to try to figure out where you're going to get this content, uh, how you're going to uh, make claims that will foster that trust and not betray it. Well, I've got good news for them because your book lie, outlines a lot of places where you can go and, and you talk about the different actors. Um, in, in one place, you were saying about how if you look among the audiences that you already have, you may find those that you can make a deeper connection with and bring on their help. Uh, you can look at employees as a stakeholder group. You can look at other vendors that are part of your supply chain. Can, can you take us through a little bit of where we might go to find this uh, set of content? Yeah. So the the that particular part, we're talking about the importance of corroborating your claims. And that's exactly what you're saying. Finding other people who can say what you are saying. It's the don't take my word for it. Here's someone else you can trust to, right? Uh, the likelihood of us all conspiring is much smaller than this just being the truth, right? So finding those folks who can do it, it's it, you can definitely look to customers, clients, uh, students, like whoever it is that, that are the beneficiaries of that promise that they can come forth and talk about their experience. You can talk to your employees, your, you know, your partners, your, your vendors, your manufacturers, whoever it is that you work with professionally that has seen that promise play out, that knows they've chosen to work for you because they've seen it. Right. Um, and you can also pull in experts. So, you know, when I, just as an example, you know, we bought a house recently um, and I've never done that before, right? So when an electrician or a plumber or whoever else is giving me quotes for things, I'm not necessarily sure. Are they just, are they raking me over the coals here or is this fair, right? They say that they have fair pricing. Um, so bringing in an expert, someone outside who has no stake in your company, ideally, um, who can say, this is the, av like, according to the American Plumbers Association, the average cost of such and such is this. Well, now I know someone else has said that you've backed it up, right? So looking for those outside experts who can uh, agree with you, who, you know, may have produced reports or studies or data points that can, can underscore what it is that you're saying really goes a long way toward corroborating all the claims that you're making. And you can make this as big or as small as you need to. It could be as simple as getting a written quote via email uh, that you can include in something, or it could be as in-depth as doing a full video interview and repurposing that content in a hundred different ways. Um, but the truth is you're, what you're looking for is who can back up this claim? Who's going to be able to, to say something similar and, and show that what I'm saying is the truth? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I really loved about the book was it pointed out a problem we have in the content world. And that is that while we want to add on claims uh, to what we're doing, that maybe less is more. Um, you point out that when we sometimes get stuck into an editorial calendar and we've already chosen that we need to deliver content on you know, platforms X and Y, We've predetermined how much stuff we have to produce without asking ourselves what we are going to say. And when we do that, we can run afoul of having a poor match between either the story or the format or the point of why we're <laughs> trying to take up someone's time. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes do you agree? We just need to pull back a bit on our content 
so that we can let the things that are important come through. A hundred percent. Yeah. There's a tremendous amount of pressure on anyone who's in marketing, sales, brand building in any capacity that we're supposed to be everywhere saying everything to everyone, right? Like you got to be dancing for TikTok while you're tweeting, while you're updating LinkedIn, you know, I don't know, while you're overseeing a Facebook group all at the same time. Um, And you got to do everything every day, right? You got to blog every day. You got to YouTube every week. Um, It's a tremendous amount of pressure. And the reality is if you are prioritizing prioritizing the the quantity or the frequency over uh, the quality of that content itself, then you're just creating busy work for yourself. The reality is that sometimes the really impactful content takes longer to create and you don't want to spread yourself too thin. Um, my, my recommendation is, is would you rather be mediocre on five platforms or great on two? Like that's mm-hmm. the choice you're really making. Do I want to be mediocre in many places because I've spread myself so thin Or do I want to focus my attention on the one or two platforms or the one or two types of content, you know, really go all in on your blog and your podcast or go all in on your Facebook community and your Twitter following, like go all in, in one or two places and you're likely to see much better results and build a much more engaged and trusting community because you're giving them the time and attention they deserve and focusing on the messages that really need to go out to them. Yeah. And I, for myself, where this book hit me square between the eyes was in those times where I have tried to produce content. And if I take a moment and soberly reflect on it, that content is merely saying I'm competent or yeah. our service is competent. Uh, and you make it clear. Uh, that's, that's the basics. Like you don't get any points for that's the bare minimum. No, you get um, some points. You still get some points because people need to know that you're competent. So but they need yeah. reminders, right? You yeah. need to obliquely say, okay, well, these are the things that we've delivered for these clients. Yep. And yeah, somebody will go, oh, okay, well, that that's not nothing. Yeah. But if you are talking endlessly and you've run out of important things to say, and now you're just down to the, oh, and we do this and that, yeah, yeah. you know. Then, then people are realizing, okay, we've scraped the bottom of the barrel. Instead, I think what's better is to stop and take those moments to say, well, if I were an outside observer, what would be a useful claim to make there? How am I backing that up? And one of the things that is so good for those particular times when you're feeling stuck and you're, you're trying to put yourself in the outside shoes is to ask, what knowledge am I taking for granted? Because a lot of times we know the claims that we make. We know, okay, well, I'm the best, the fastest, whatever it is. But our audience may not have enough industry understanding or technical understanding um, or just experience to know that that's even important in the first place. Like, you know, the example before when the painter came in and said, I only use such and such brand and we only use, you know, semi-gloss. Well, that may mean something to someone, but I don't know enough about painting to know whether that's good, bad or neutral. So that's where the educational content can be super valuable to say, What is it that I already know that I'm taking for granted and how can I create educational content that actually helps them understand the claim and the importance of that claim even better? This is especially true if you're in a highly regulated industry, you have a very technical brand, you have a very technical offering um, that, you know, especially if your, your buyer is not your end user. So if you have like Uh, you know, leadership at a company that's choosing which platform to use, and they may not understand the intricacies of the platform, we've got to explain what those technicalities mean so that they can relay it to their engineers or whatever the case may be. That educational content is so, so key, because not only does it help them become a better, a better customer, a better client, you know, better understand your claims, but it also at the same time demonstrates that you really know what you're talking about. So many of us who are embedded inside brands have trouble with this. Um, I think at both ends, frankly. So there's the, am I uh, explaining uh, enough, you know, or am I kind of keeping it over at the expert, you know, inside baseball level? Mm -hmm. We've got to make sure that we have the right amount of expertise in our content that's going to land with the audience that we're trying to reach. Yeah, 100%. 
Um, and keeping in mind that, again, the content that you're creating may not be for the person you're speaking to, but for them to pass along to someone else. So really good example here is um, having technical documentation. If you're you know, a tech product or a software or something like that, and being able to say to that that salesperson, that buyer, hey, here's our documentation if you wanted to pass that along to your engineers so they could take a look and see how the integration process would go. So they may not personally make any use of that, but having that content sort of in your back pocket to be able to hand over and allow them to pass on to another stakeholder, another decision maker can really go a long way. Yeah. So there we have more proof points that we're offering, but we're kind of tearing it by who needs to to see it, right? And that technical person will want that granular version, but don't ask the person who's just relaying it to also sit through that tedium. (laughs) Yeah, because chances are they're going to tune it out and and not do it justice anyway, right? So being able to have that documented. um, I also think if, you know, this is a great opportunity for different departments to work together, where you have sales working with engineering or sales working with marketing or customer service working with marketing and really understanding what are the questions you are getting asked all the time and how can we create something that helps answer that question in a more robust, more reusable, repurposable way. Um, Because so many times, you know, your sales team may be getting the very same questions over and over and the marketing team just didn't know that we could create a very easy case study that alleviates that fear. Um, Or same thing, you know, our our buyers think this is so complicated, but if we could only show this snippet of code to their engineers, they would know it's an easy thing to do. So that kind of stuff can just, you know, really make a big difference. You brought up the salespeople there. And again, there's no shortage of people that we can enlist to help with this information. What's your take on, for example, going into our own data and bringing out some interesting factoids? You know, 42% of our, you know, uh, long-term customers have found that, you know, using this product of ours is is a very good thing for them. Uh, do, Do you think it's useful to people for us to take that first party data and, you know, at least expose the the little numbers and highlights from it. A hundred percent. I think customer surveys, it comes back to that corroboration we were talking about being able to point to other people who say things, you know, don't take our word for it, that we're great to work with. 69% of the people that work with us renew for a full year, you know, or whatever, whatever that stat is. Um, the wonderful thing about that too is, it's, it's an opportunity to reconnect with the customers that you know or the clients you know are really passionate and have had positive experiences. And, you know, in the process of doing a survey or sending out those feelers to try to gather some of that data, you may uncover, you know, the most amazing case study you had never considered. You know, when they say, yeah, not only, am, you know, do I agree that I would renew, but I've saved X tens of thousands of dollars since changing. And you're like, whoa, how did we not know that? Like, that's something we want to talk about, right? Uh, you know, or I've, you know, this has changed the entire way we operate. It's it's optimized our practices and saved us, you know, tens of man hours a day. Like, whoa, if I hadn't asked, I wouldn't even know. So sometimes that data gathering, that survey is is a wonderful chance to to unearth some some really great case studies and customer stories. And boy, does it ever flip those content planning meetings on its head. Um, You know, instead of coming in, all right, I want everybody in with an idea and invariably people come in with, okay, well, let's write an article about uh, what a customer should know before they start working with a company like ours. (laughs) Those will get banished and instead we will have really good customer stories, these windfalls that came from us looking inside of our data or surveying our base, Mm -hmm. right? They're they're lying around like acres of diamonds if we just go looking for them. I love that you said diamonds because I talk about it all the time as mining your your life for story ideas because that... I mean, that's the the questions that we hear that we're creating content to answer. That's mining your life for content. You know, customer stories, you're mining. Those stories are already there. You don't have to make them up. You just have to find them. That's how I've always seen it. You can even look in your sent items. If you have, you know, if you're in a customer facing role, you have said these things. Yeah. I I think the rule is if it, if it takes longer than five minutes to write the email, then you could probably use some, some explanatory content. And if you send the email multiple times, the same sort of email, then you probably need some explanatory content. Right. Uh, 
But I think a lot of this also comes from my background. I, I studied journalism. And so I have never thought of stories and content as like a, a scarce resource. You know, we were sort of taught that these stories are everywhere and it's just our job to find them. So sometimes just that little mindset shift of understanding, like, you don't have to make this stuff up. You don't have to be, you know, the most creative person in the world and design an elaborate strategy. Like you just have to find the stories that are already there and start looking in places you maybe haven't looked yet. Ideally, you would have been uh, capturing at least who you could go to talk to up until now. The the second best time to begin that Right now. Inquiry is now, <laughs> yeah. but the best time to do it is where you've already done it and you simply need to go through and curate from what you've already made. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're talking about this sort of prove it mindset and letting it leak into these different parts of your operations. If you have that mindset of knowing I'm going to need to provide proof for my claims, I'm going to need to back up the results that I claim to give, it kind of keeps you in that mindset of, well, I probably should document this for later. It, it reminds you like, I'm going to need this down the line. Uh, and that kind of mindset makes it so much easier, like you said, to, to pull out those case studies or know the customer to reach out to for a quote. Yeah. That five minutes on a Tuesday, six minutes on a Friday, the time that you actually need it. Boy, have you ever saved yourself anguish? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, Melanie, is there anything else from the book or uh, from your own personal experience in this area that you want to make sure you don't leave us without giving? Well, I always just like to caveat. I think if if you don't come from this world or if the things we're talking about here might seem scary or overwhelming or like I don't have anywhere near the resources or time to do such a thing, uh, just a reminder that you can start small, that creating one piece of proof is better than creating none that validating one claim is better than validating none, you know, that posting one blog is better than having nothing. So, you know, please be kind to yourself, understand the realities and limitations of your role and the number of hours in a day. Um, but look for those small opportunities to start backing up the things you're saying, because once you get into a habit of it, and once your customers get into a habit of seeing it, it can really make a transformative difference for your business. You got it. For people who want to read the book or find out more about you, where would you send them? Yeah, so the book is available in, in most places you like to buy books online. Um, I always recommend bookshop.org so you can support a local bookstore in your purchasing. Um, but we're working on the audiobook as well, so you'll see that soon. And uh, if you want to learn more about me, I'm very I'm very SEO optimized. I'm the only one of me. So if you search for Melanie Diesel on your platform of choice, you should come across me. Or you can head to storyfuel.co, so storyfuel.co. And that's sort of my home base with links to everything else you might be wondering about. That's right. And depending whether people are over on the uh, British side of the alphabet, where it's D-E-Z-I-E-L mm -hmm. or American D-E-Z-I-E-L, <laughs> uh, you are the only one of you. And it's uh, great that we were able to have you for this show. Thanks so much for coming on. Well, thanks for coming and letting me share my story. All the links will be provided in the show notes. And I'm sure that people got some insight out of this that'll help make their funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.